Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining Black Women's Blueprint and the National Organization for Women for our sixth session in the series, 100 Days of a Feminist Agenda, Healing from Centuries of Oppression. This week, we're focusing on amplifying LGBTQIA plus activism and uplifting the pursuit for equality and fundamental rights. As folks continue to join us, we invite you to let us know in the chat box where you're um, checking in from. Uh, some basic housekeeping. We'll be doing our best to keep the conversation to one hour. We will have a Q&A session towards the end of the hour. We'd love to hear from you all. Please type your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. And please use the chat box for comments and reflections. Also understand that we try our best to answer as many questions as possible as we balance our time together. All our events are ASL accessible, and I'd like to thank our ASL translators, Rebecca DeSantis and Shannon Garrison from RGC Access. And with, the, with that, I'd like to um, welcome our moderators, Bear Atwoods and Paris, Paris Hatcher. Welcome everyone. My name is Bear Atwood and I'm the Vice President of NOW. And my name is Paris Hatcher. My pronouns are she, her, and hers and I'm the founder and director of Black Feminist Future. We are excited to have y'all join us tonight for our sixth listening and discussion session. I am thrilled that Black Women's Blueprint and NOW have joined together to embark on this series. Under the administration of 45, I refuse to say his name, these past four years, the bold advances that women have made over the past decades particularly those of our Black, Indigenous, women of color, Latinx, trans, and gender non-conforming relatives have come under threat of regression. These communities have been healing from centuries of oppression and are no longer willing to be ignored or silenced. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to uplift our much needed diverse voices but we know there is so much that needs to be done to truly make a difference in the lives of our lives and the lives of the women we serve. That is why beginning with the first 100 days of the new administration and continuing through 2021, we're bringing these voices to the forefront to share different perspectives and experiences, highlighting the personal impact and what issues matter most to all of us. Civil rights laws provide protections based on race, color, national origin, sex, disability, and religion. However, federal law does not explicitly protect individuals from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. LGBTQIA people are being denied basic legal protections in states across the country due to the lack of comprehensive federal non-discrimination laws. 2020 saw a tragic new record of fatal violence against transgender and gender non-conforming people in this country, particularly against black and brown transgender women. More than one in three LGBTQIA plus people faced discrimination of some kind in this past year. Their pursuit for equality and fundamental rights challenges cultural beliefs that insist on seeing tragedy in sex and gender identities that threaten a patriarchal status quo. This thinking is informed by a racist paradigm that has kept its foot on the necks of each of us for centuries, while also confining men to a destructive code of toxic masculinity. And with that, I'm pleased to pass it to Paris 
to introduce our next guest. Thank you, Bear. I'm excited to introduce Congresswoman Sharice Davids, who has come to share a few words with us. Just a little bit about Congresswoman Davids. She was raised by a single mother who served in the Army for 20 years. After graduating from Leavenworth High School, Representative Davids worked her way through Johnson County Community College and the University of Missouri, Kansas City before earning a law degree from Cornell Law School. As a first generation college student who worked the entire time she was in college, Representative Davids understands the importance of quality public schools and affordable higher education. When she was sworn into the 116th Congress, Representative Davids became one of the first two Native American women to serve in Congress. She sits on the Transportation and Infrastructure and Small Business Committees. Representative Davids wants others to have the same opportunities to achieve their goals, which is why she has focused her career on bringing more opportunities to the middle class. In Congress, Representative Davids is putting Kansans first, working to limit the influence of special interests and fighting to make healthcare more affordable and accessible to everyone. So welcome Representative Davids, thank you for joining us. Um, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, evening. I'm not sure where everybody is at. Um, and hopefully you can uh, hear me and see me and also uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, inclusion of ASL interpreters. Uh, so thank you to the interpreters as well. Um, well, I'm excited to be here with you. I wish that we could all see each other in person. Uh, and hopefully we are not too far from getting the chance to do that. I am uh, very uh, excited about the conversation that y'all are going to have uh, today. Um, and just appreciate being included in, uh, in this event. So uh, I know you, you gave my, uh, my background, so you've given my speech. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I am proud to represent the, the third congressional district here in Kansas. Uh, definitely proud to be one of the first two native women elected uh, to Congress and uh, the first out uh, member of the LGBTQ plus community to represent Kansas in uh, in Washington, DC. And, you know, one of the things that I, one of the reasons, I guess, that I, I feel so uh, proud to be uh, part of the, the class uh, in 2018 that I got to be part of is because I think that what we saw in 2018 was this um, across the country, this uh, resetting of expectations. And I kind of talk about this uh, a lot because what we saw in 2020 was kind of that, that next step. And I, I have always thought of what we did in 2018 as a country, and um, certainly I'm glad that Kansas got to be part of this, uh, was, was really just one of the steps in the long journey that we have been on as a country to uh, to, to get our country to the place that we know that it can be. And um, so, you know, when we think about those expectations, we think about uh, who, who do we expect to see running for office? Who do we expect uh, to be able to support? How do we expect to be able to support folks? And who do we expect to see actually elected? Those are the things that are, are really shifting right now. And um, I just got to be a, a part of, a small part of that in 2018. I'm loving what I'm seeing as we move forward uh, across the country. And, and it's not just about Congress, it's about our state legislatures. Uh, it's about our uh, local electeds. It's about our mayors, our city council people, who sits on our school boards. And, and we're seeing in the midst of this uh, devastating pandemic, just how important all of those decision makers are to uh, the health and well-being of our communities. And, um, you know, at the house level, 
I, I feel like we as a class brought a, a, certainly a new uh, diverse voice to, uh, to Congress. Uh, we brought uh, a diverse set of experiences. I often think about how, uh, and I, I imagine that so many of the folks who are here um, that will be speaking today and also who are, who are participating in, um, uh, in the conversation and, and watching know what it's like to be the only person like you in the room and know how um, isolating that can be. And also sometimes how empowering it can be to be the person that says, uh, actually let's, let's slow down here because we skimmed over something that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and I think that what, what we're seeing in Congress and you know, it's definitely not just certainly not just me. There are so many people who are, who are bringing things up that uh, folks just haven't, haven't heard about um, because unfortunately for too long, we have had so many elected officials, particularly in, in the federal government who uh, don't recognize the validity of everyone's experience, the value of everyone's uh, humanity and Right now, we have the opportunity to continue to, to take those steps forward. And that's what y'all are doing. I'm like very excited about all of the, the um, just like the, the, cool, the cool people who are on, who are on here today. And um, I kind of wish that, I kind of wish I could see everybody, um, but I know some folks don't, the rest of my place doesn't look this neat and organized. That's all I'm gonna say. And then I'm going to skip forward to, um, I just want to highlight the chance that I got this year to, to vote on um, the Equality Act for a second time. Uh, uh, I know it, it was already mentioned the uh, level of um, uh, d discrimination and disparities. And uh, when we talk about the LGBTQ plus uh, community, we know that in a lot of states, uh, Kansas is one of them. Uh, folks are still uh, facing discrimination. Um, folks are still facing uh, lack of access to, uh, to basic needs, but also to opportunities. And uh, we know that when it comes to, uh, to the way that the LGBTQ plus community and uh, uh, black and brown communities and other communities of color intersect that, um, that those outcomes just get worse. And so voting on the Equality Act is something that I'm, I'm really glad I got the chance to do. Uh, but it also, it's not, it's not the end of the line. Uh, there's still gonna be more work to do after that. Um, you know, if we can get the Senate to, to pass it and we have a president that will sign it. Um, and, then, and then more of the work will have to take place. And, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really glad that, uh, you all are, uh, that you all are hosting this conversation today. I'm really, really glad that, um, I, I got invited to participate and, um, I will look forward to seeing all of you, uh, in the future, hopefully in person. Thank you so much, Representative Davids, for your comments, um, and for joining us. And I will pass it on to you, Bear. Thank you. Um, we're really excited to have wonderful panelists with us tonight. Charlotte Clymer is a writer, transgender activist, communications consultant, and military veteran. She currently serves as the Director of Communications and Strategy at Catholics for Choice. Before that, she was the Press Secretary for Rapid Response at the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest civil rights organization dedicated to advancing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer equality. Her political and social commentary has been quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Guardian, and numerous other outlets. Her work has been published in USA Today, The Washington Post, NBC News, Cosmopolitan, Glamour, GQ, The Independent, and other publications. She has also been a guest commentator on MSNBC and CBS Sunday Morning. Rodrigo Velasquez is a legislative aide in the Virginia House of Delegates, community advocate, and former undocumented immigrant. 
He is passionate about building community power to change laws to build a more just and equitable world. He currently serves on the boards of Just Neighborhoods, an organization that provides high quality immigration legal services to low income immigrants, asylees and refugees in the DC area. To UDOC Mason, a student organization at George Mason University aimed at creating an inclusive environment for undocumented students and the Latino Advisory Board at the Office of Governor Ralph Northam. And then we have Erica Ayudela. I'm sorry, that's Ayudela Dixon. She's the training programs manager at the New York Anti-Violence Project, where they coordinate the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs and work to provide training and technical assistance, develop resources, and share successful models with advocates across the country for LGBTQ and HIV affected communities. Erica is also part of the Community Advisory Board of the Disability Project as part of the Transgender Community Law Center. They're the leading community-based participatory research with QT BIPOC Disabled Survivors of Violence and leading curriculum development by and for Black, queer, and trans disabled community. Prior to her work at AVP, Erica worked at Black Women's Blueprint, where they fought to get Black women and girls who were survivors of sexual violence centered in policy. As a survivor of sexual violence themselves, Erica believes this work is both deeply personal and political and grounds everything she does in using a queer Black feminist lens. Erica, my apologies for mispronouncing your name. I wanna thank all of you for being here and um, let's dive right in. Our first question is for you, Charlotte. One of the most significant issues the LGBTQIA community faces now is a slew of legislative attacks on trans people, especially trans kids. Currently, there are 22 bills in 17 states that want to ban trans youth from sports. And just this week, the Arkansas State Legislature overrode the governor's veto on a transgender health care bill. Could you talk about why these legislative attacks are so dangerous? Well, they're dangerous because without any merit whatsoever, they target transgender children, uh, not only in the way that trans children are able to be part of their communities and play in sports teams, uh, but also in how they attack transgender health care. Some of these bills, like the one in Arkansas, are quite literally trying to ban gender affirming health care for trans kids. And let's be clear about this. This overwhelmingly affects black and brown transgender and non-binary people uh, who you know, are the focus of memes, online slander, attacks by Republican lawmakers. This is as much racist as it is about transphobia. And we really need to recognize that intersection. Um, you know, what is so terrible about this too is that we know from medical authorities, every major medical authority has come out and said there is no use for these laws whatsoever. The American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, every scientific and medical authority has come out and said that trans and non-binary children need to be affirmed, they need gender-affirming health care, and they need to be a part of sports teams. And by the way, so women athletes, Megan Rapino, Billie Jean King, Candace Parker, the Women's Sports Foundation, women athletes across the board have also said that trans kids need to be allowed to play in sports, that this is a non-issue. And in fact, even when Republican lawmakers were reached out to to ask for examples on why these bills were needed, they couldn't identify issues even in their own state of how it was a problem. So we're gonna fight back against this because we'll be damned if trans kids are gonna be attacked by this uh, with such cowardly and cynical and transphobic people uh, in the Republican party who keep attacking them. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for those remarks. It's really important that we, that we do understand that and also that it's also incredibly patriarchal, right? Um, and the control of bodies and the, in the keeping together the gender binary, which doesn't exist. Like we're fighting to break that. So Erica, um, I have a question for you. The LG LGBTQIA people continue to face violence across the country. What can we do to put an end to this violence? How does intersectionality play into this problem? Thank you for that question. Um, thank you all for um, invite me to be here. I'm really excited. I think when I 
was looking at that question, um, what came to mind first was what's at the root cause, right, of the violence that's happening. And if we look at the root causes of the violence that's happening, we're looking at the criminalization fundamentally of black and brown bodies. We're looking at the continual um, way that systems have been set up to, um, to make it not just hard, harder and dangerous for people to be um, LGBTQ, non-binary, trans, but also that those folks are experiencing incredibly high levels of violence. Um, and when we think about intersectionality, I think it's really important to think about um, and remember that intersectionality is not fundamentally just about identity, right? It's not just because I'm a Black, queer, femme person that I have a more higher chance of experiencing violence. It's about the systems that are created that make it so that violence is more likely to be enacted against my body, right? And so we really need to look at dismantling those systems. We need to look at and take seriously, what does it look like to defund the police everywhere, right? We need to be looking at like, what does it mean to set up systems of safety for people that are rooted in people's humanity, um, that are rooted in the idea that people can take accountability for violence and not have to be um, pushed away and not have to be um, disposed of. And when we look at folks who are leading this fight, these are LGBTQ, these are black and brown trans women, these are indigenous folks, these are disabled folks, like folks who have been doing this work forever. Um, and so I think when we're talking about like, how do we end violence against LGBTQ folks, it's following the lead of the people who have been doing this work and who are the most impacted by this work and amplifying the voices and the work that they're doing and also um, doing that work in our own communities and ourselves to be like, wait, how am I internalized, how have I internalized transphobia? How have I internalized homophobia? How have I internalized anti-Blackness? How have I internalized white supremacy? And really doing that work um, to um, uproot that in yourself and also in community while doing the systems work. Thank you so much for your response, really keying in on the systems because we are not wrong, right? And while our um, LGBTQIA folks are facing a lot of violence, we also know that we are, in, in particular, our trans sisters and siblings are vibrant and are, are, you know, incredibly valuable, priceless, you know, to us. And so thank you for your response. Um, our next question is for Rodrigo. Young people are moving the dial on many social justice issues including LGBTQIA plus issues. As the co-founder of the Trevor Project, Celeste Lucine says, change happens when young people begin to age up and make the future happen. What do you see as the future for LGBTQIA plus activism and the opportunities for youth to lead and continue to push us forward? Yeah, I think I've been reflecting on that for some time, especially, um, Today, uh, when I woke up, I saw news. Um, I live in Virginia, and um, there's two cases that were just filed um, seeking to halt uh, the policies that the Virginia Department of Health had um, tried to give public schools about how to best make inclusive and welcoming uh, environments and schools and public schools for transgender students. And I realized that um, when I first went to school, the conversation around LGBTQ uh, I write uh, really centered around kind of one or two niche things. I think growing up, it was always kind of, can I get married? And like, can I get fired from work? Um, but what, I, what I've noticed and what I appreciate now more so than ever is this deeper understanding that LGBTQ and queer rights is just a very broad thing that um, includes things such as uh, safety in schools, which has you know, made national headlines this week, but it's also about things like decriminalizing sex work, ensuring that LGBTQ people have comprehensive access to healthcare, um, which could include so many things that are often not talked about. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think the idea that youth now know, and we're growing up in an environment where our understanding of what justice is, is more than just kind of this two, this like two lane down the road, this is where we are fully equal and we'll stop working till then um, sort of mentality and the idea that, 
not, none of us are free until everyone's free and that we really have to keep fighting to lift up those uh, most at the margins. So I'm really grateful for a lot of the, the youth work that's been leading on that. I've been particularly impressed in the past uh, week or two actually around um, some of the sex work decriminalization uh, education that's been happening. I think that's so critical because we're talking about people who even during a public health pandemic lack labor rights, uh, like protections in the workplace because they are workers and they everyone deserves the um, opportunity to, to be in a safe work environment and so on. So um, really grateful for the young people out in the in the fight. I like to consider myself as one of the young people, but um, you know, some people like to say I'm not. You know. But um, I think that's our, you know, I think that's really where the future is, and I'm really grateful for everyone, including those from um, the generations before us who really paved the road for for this greater understanding. Thank you for that, and we'll definitely consider you part of the young group, um, Paris. Or you might be considered what I am, which is a yelder, a youth elder, put it together, yelder. I think, but I think I'm, I'm an in-betweener to let you know, but yeah, a yelder. Um, so, oh, excuse me, I have two questions for y'all. So one issue that isn't, that's not discussed enough is how all of these attacks on queer communities have taken a toll on our mental health. So on queer, trans, non, you know, gender non-conforming, non-binary folks' health, mental health. A recent survey by the Trevor Project conducted between October and December of 2020 found that over 90% of LGBTQ youth said that recent politics negatively influence their well-being. What should we be doing about this? How can we support LGBTQIA plus people when their existence is so politicized? And I will, um, I will it's for all of you to respond, but I'm gonna actually um, pass it off to you, Rodrigo, to, to kick us off with responding. Well, that's a loaded question. Um, Cause I think, you know, I'm, I'm I'll be honest, like sometimes I just don't even know how to show up for myself sometimes when I wake up and I just realize like, I am not in a good place and I just need to figure out how to get to a good place um, so that I can be there for other people. So, um, I, you know, I think just being in community with, with other folks has been really, uh, really great. Um, even if I, I am more of an introvert, so the social distancing piece has um, not affected me over the past year, to be honest. Um, but I, I do have a really great village that shows up for me um, and is really proactive. And I will say, I think the proactive piece is really important now more so than ever. Um, we can't expect for a queer person to say, look, I'm going through X, Y, Z, whether it's a crisis or whether it's just kind of like uh, going downhill mentally and feeling isolated and alone and attacked. I think uh, especially allies uh, outside the community can be really proactive as things happen, even before things happen, because we can anticipate these attacks in state legislatures. We can see these and anticipate these attacks in school boards. Um, they're not new. Um, a bunch of these, you know, uh, hateful people are following a playbook that's been, you know, they've been using all of history. So um, I think the proactive piece has really been beneficial. And I'm, uh, you know, I'll just speak from a personal experience, even before a lot of the things were happening uh, around healthcare and um, that, you know, personally affect me. I had really great friends who uh, made sure to check in on me before kind of the news became overwhelming, just to make sure that I could bear and kind of like weather all of that. Um, so I think that's, you know, probably the one thing that um, if it's like an actionable item, I'd be like, be proactive with, with, with your village and with your team and with your loved ones. Yeah, what you said is real. I mean, we are holding a lot. This has been as the buzzword, the keyword unprecedented in so many ways. We were, have been surviving so much. And um, yeah, so um, Erica, how about you? What are your thoughts around, what should we be thinking about, you know, the impact around mental health um, and how should we be thinking about responding? Yeah, um, I also, this is such a loaded question, but um, it really resonated, Rodrigo, what you were saying with like, some days I can't even show up for myself. So like, how do I show up for my people? Um, and one of the things that 
I have learned and has grown throughout, I think the pandemic specifically was that kind of proactive community building piece um, and recognizing like all of my friends, like we're all there, you know, we're all at that level of burnout, beyond burnout, beyond, you know, anything we've experienced before um, and being able to check in with friends and not even like really even saying like, how's it going today? It's like, actually, like, how are you doing? And like, let's talk about it. And I think the being willing and able to hear the response for people um, when you actually ask how they're doing is really important. I think um, a lot of mental health stuff also stems from being invalidated. And there's nothing more invalidating than having people fighting to um, invalidate your existence for people literally you're seeing people who look like you day after day being murdered you're seeing people lo who look like you or your community just going through so much trauma and that affects your physical and mental health um and the thing i love about like black women's future is like envisioning like reminding ourselves and being grounded in this idea that there is a future and that we are needed to be in that future. We are called to be in that future. Um, and that I, something for me that I always hold on to is that like, I know that I got ancestors who didn't even dream of that like me as a person would be here, but they knew that the work that they were doing was gonna open it up so that I could be here. And so what keeps me going is thinking about like, who am I opening up? the possibility for um, in the future, even though I might not ever know them. Um, but holding on to that, I think, and creating spaces for joy and healing, um, even though it's hard, um, has also definitely kept me going. Yes, yeah, so true that, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot, we're holding a lot, but also seeing ourselves as this, Alexis Pauline Gums talks about this through line that we, are connected to our past, but we also are like connected to our future. And um, really our, our precious selves, um, we need to be really treating ourselves as if we are as precious as we oftentimes treat others. How about you, Charlotte? Um, what is your thinking around, with the statistics around what's happening with queer and trans folks' mental health? Um, what should we be doing about this? And how can we support LGBTQIA plus folks when their existence, just being who we are, is so politicized? Yeah, I mean, Rodrigo and Erica really nailed it. I, I would only say that the public awareness of LGBTQ identities and specifically trans identities uh, is really low right now. And because we live in an era of disinformation, it's so easy for anti-trans people specifically to put out propaganda that clearly maligns and damages and harms trans people. You know, we've seen Republican lawmakers in Congress uh, use the use the stimulus uh, budget process to literally, you know, offer an amendment to ban trans kids from sports, and they were able to do that because of the lack of information about trans people, about trans health care. And so, you know, what I would really love to see, and I think what would be beneficial for our mental health overall, um, and I say this with love, is for LGBTQ allies, and specifically for trans allies, to really make a little more effort into teaching themselves about trans health care, about trans identities, you know, about the experiences of trans people overall. You know, Google is a subscription-free service, and uh, knowledge, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And I'm not being snarky when I say that, you know, I'm a white person. I have a lot to learn about racial equality. I'm an able-bodied person. I have a lot to learn about disability. You know, we all have a lot to learn in our own allyship, but it really hurts me when I see some folks in the progressive community who clearly don't know anything about trans health care or trans identities. And it shows. And so what we need for y'all to do is just make a little bit of effort. I promise you that will go a long way toward helping us. So important that you said that, Charlotte, that, you know, you know, ignorance is bliss and some folks actually want to be ignorant, right? And to create this division to uh, able to hoard and keep power and privilege over folks, right? And it's 
the reality is that we know that it is violent. It's also dangerous. And many times it's, it's deadly. And um, we know that in the work that we are doing that we're up against an opposition that really um, will do anything to pivot. And, you know, I think what we saw in the last administration is that, you know, there was a promise to build this um, racist wall, right? And then if you can't deliver on that, then let's like find someone else. So, okay, let's now focus on trans children, right? It's like, now we have all these people who are gonna, you know, the, you know, things are not so stacked towards um, the other side. So let's try to find folks. And especially I think what we can do is to move from allies to accomplices, right? That we need to be not silently talking to each other, but talking with your family showing up, showing out, um, and really um, confronting, especially if you do not share that identity and you have power in that, it is time to activate, move from ally to accomplice. And so I have, um, I have another question that we already have for y'all, and then we have some other questions from the audience. In reference to the questions from the audience, I think a link has gone out to populate some of those questions, or you put them in the chat box, you put them on Facebook, but ask us some questions, y'all. Ask your panelists. You have experts who are brilliant. So ask. So finally, um, we want to know, are there any policy solutions? So we know a lot that's happening in the world. Are there any policy solutions, um, I think on the federal, but also on the local, um, on the state level, that you think it, it would be important for this audience of folks to be advocating for. And I will just popcorn it. So whoever wants to get started around policies that folks right now, we have folks that are populating, they're all over the country. What should they be watching for? What should they be supporting? Um, what should they be advancing? I'm gonna go to you, Charlotte. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was, I didn't want to take up too much space here, but you know, right now the biggest thing you can do, and this is not the whole, this is not the whole thing, but the biggest thing you can do is work on getting the Equality Act passed. Because right now in most of the United States, LGBTQ people still face discrimination in housing and credit, public accommodations, jury service. All these aspects of the public square are closed off to not only trans people, but gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer people overall. So if we get the Equality Act passed, that would ban discrimination everywhere throughout the United States against LGBTQ people. Right now it's in the Senate. We need 60 votes. It's gonna be hard to get there, but I promise you that if we are working as hard as like Representative Davids is, who's voted for this legislation now twice, we can get it passed. Um, and I don't wanna steal anyone's thunder, but, but really quickly too, that's not the end of it. We need to demand that undocumented people who are trans and LGBTQ be released immediately. Um, you know, they are seeking asylum, they need our help, this needs to be done right now. And finally, I would really love for folks to pressure the White House to make a task force to address the ongoing epidemic of violence against trans people, primarily against black and brown, black and brown trans women. It's a huge uh, problem right now. Last year was the deadliest year on record, so it needs to be done. Awesome. So those are three clear um orders, right? And I'm sure that after this, folks will have ways to be able to plug in. Um, Rodrigo, how about you? Do you have any um, policy solutions that you can offer this team of folks? Yeah, and um, uh, working in a state legislature, I always tell people when, when the federal government can't act, state governments need to act. So um, Virginia actually passed our version of the Equality Act um, to establish protections for LGBTQ people in um, housing, public accommodations, and the workplace uh, last year. So we have um, good solid state protections there. Um, you know, I'll be honest though, I think um, outside of, you know, just like Charlotte said, there are, there are issues that are still not being addressed that can be addressed and that must be talked about. So, I mean, some of the policies that I think are super important and could hit a little closer to home is definitely solitary confinement of LGBTQ people um, in prisons and in immigration detention centers. And these are, it's inhumane what's going on right now that needs to stop. That happens across different party, when different parties are in power, um, this practice has been going on. So it's definitely achievable to stop this practice. 
Um, and that can be, um, I think, acted on as soon as possible. I think there are also really important reforms, and I, I'm chiming on this just because I think uh, it is not talked about enough, but um, you know, updating kind of laws as it relates to sex work um, is really important. Um, we, these are just, this is a, an issue that's so often tucked under the rug because it touches on an issue that um, is sometimes seen as taboo um, and it's oftentimes linked with our community. So I think kind of, you know, um, destigmatizing that and having a frank conversation about what can be done to lift up these workers, um, you know, who are many of us who we know and love and care for, um, that needs to happen soon too. Thank you, so important. So much around this work is making sure that we are always seeing, making those who've been made invisible visible, right? That's so much of what this work is about. And Erica, how about you? Any policy recommendations um, or things that you think folks should, um, should be working on? Yeah, um, I definitely 100% co-sign the um, working on um, decriminalizing and destigmatizing sex work. Um, I saw some folks in the chat are in New York. I know, don't know if you're in New York City, but um, we have the Decrim NY Coalition um, that is really pushing to um, yeah, decriminalize sex work in New York City. Um, we were able actually to uh, repeal the walking while trans law in New York City um, that was really targeting black and brown um, sex workers. Um, and I'm sure that there are similar city, state, local um, laws um, wherever people are at that um, you can start digging into and um, also start organizing around. Um, and then the other big thing that I would push for is like New York City um, and I think New Mexico now have both um, approved ending qualified immunity for police departments. And that is huge because that is one step closer towards the ultimate goal of defunding the police, the ultimate goal of abolishing um, the system as we know it right now. Um, so I think organizing around um, those issues and pushing for those policies. Is, mm, sorry, these are excellent suggestions that y'all have given um, given for us to think about and consider. And I hope that folks have been um, on the Now or Black Women's Blueprint team will gather them to make them available. And as you mentioned, Erica, and it just came up in the, the chat, policy is awesome, but organizing is even better. Right. So the way that we really work is that, you know, you move policy by organizing, by having a base of folks who can really who are educated and taking action for long term systemic change. Um, so actually, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bear, for the questions that we have that have um, for our audience. Great. Thank you. Um, so the first question we have is in regards particularly to the anti trans bill but this could really reflect on anything. How can people who are not in those states help? I live in Mississippi, and so I know what it's like to be, to be fighting an uphill battle. Talk about how people who are outside of states like Mississippi can help. Um, Erica? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you can still be calling representatives, you can still be um, phone banking for people, you can still be organizing. Um, also, the getting the information out there as well, um, just so people know what's going on um, and people know how dangerous the legislation actually is. Um, and again, like kind of making that personal connection with people is like, this is specifically um, targeting trans children, right? And like specifically targeting black and brown, transgender, non-conforming, non-binary children. Um, and really like digging into that with um, your community, with your people. Um, and I mean, like Paris said, I'm all for organizing. So <laughs> I, you know, I think there's always organizing to be done um, to be supporting um, those efforts as well. Charlotte, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, sure. Erica nailed it. 
you know, make sure you're calling your state legislatures. Uh, but but even those outside, you know, I'm from DC, well, excuse me, I live in DC, but I'm from Texas. But I've been calling every state where there is an anti-trans bill being considered. South Dakota, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, all those states where trans children are being attacked. Make sure you call the governor's office, make sure you call um, you know, leadership within those state legislatures and make it clear that there is no reasoning, there is no merit, there is no scientific validation for these laws to be passed. And one more thing, you know, my nine to five is doing reproductive health care with Catholics for Choice. But one of the people that I really look to right now is Chase Strangio, who is a lawyer at the ACLU. Uh, I follow his account on the daily looking for any actions that need to be done. And so I'm going to type his, his, uh, his username in the chat box here. And I just encourage y'all to follow his updates because he's really great at breaking down these laws that, that are being considered and what we can do to stop them. Great. And Rodrigo, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I'll co-sign on all of that. And one of the things that, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I grew up as an organizer and that's always in my heart before I joined the government um, was that um, you it's people power that makes the change. So really building up that movement, getting people to understand, because I saw a question regarding work, that economic justice is intrinsically connected to uh, queer justice and that we, you know, when we tear down things like right to work, that that lifts up queer workers in wherever the right to work state was. So, um, I, you know, movement building is how we accomplish uh, all the important things that we still have left to do um, and obviously um, against all the attacks that we're seeing in, in some of these uh, state legislatures. So I want to just add one further thing to that. And I think we've talked about this a little bit tonight, but one of the, one of the things I think we always need to do is support people in their own community doing the work. And as I said, I'm, I'm from Mississippi. I know that there's a small but fierce group of people in Mississippi who worked really hard to defeat an anti-trans bill here, not successfully, but worked really hard. I think it's important to find out who's doing the work on the ground and, and then follow their lead. And so if they, if they have specific things that need to get done, follow their lead, consider donating to them and, and really follow the lead of the people in the community on the ground doing the work. Um, so we have another question from someone who wants to know, how do we protect LGBTQ plus workers in so-called work, right to work states where employees can be fired for unstated reasons? This person has a girlfriend who's a kindergarten teacher and is afraid to come out at work until she has tenure because she could be fired without even having to state a reason. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Got to repeal the right to work. I mean, that, I, that's, I doubt that was the first thing when I saw that question. I was like, this is why we cannot have right to work, why we need to empower workers to be able to organize in the workplace, to fight for their rights, to establish these protections to, uh, and to collectively bargain for living wages. Uh, anti-discrimination policies within the workplace, training and education. Um, you know, right to work is such a funny phrase for them to use um, because it's literally the right not to work. Um, I live in a right to work state and um, I'm very familiar with, with, with this and the fight that we have um, even in Virginia, even under uh, full democratic control, we don't have the votes yet to overturn, um, uh, to repeal our right to work laws. So. Um, you know, what, what I'll say is, um, you, if you live in a right to work state right now, you know, I'm with you. Uh, hopefully we can repeal all right to work. I know the PRO Act in Congress is, 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 is one of those uh, kind of vehicles for that. Um, but until that's passed, um, you know, just continue to organize in the workplace. Um, if you know anyone who, if you're a teacher, I think there might be like an education association or a, un a teacher's union that maybe you can get connected to and, and, and get that there. But um, that's just the thing, like this is why we need to understand that our movements are so connected. Uh, we need to fight for workers' rights because that will lift up 
uh, queer workers. We need to fight for reproductive justice because that's going to lift up queer people who seek reproductive health care. So, um, so on and so forth. I mean, we could list all of them and um, there's not enough time, unfortunately, to do all of that. But um, I think the point is, is we need to work together for that. That's so true. I mean, I think it's why intersectionality is so important because we do need to lift up each other because we're, we're all in this struggle together. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Just really quickly, um, I think this also highlights why it's so important for workplaces and employers to remember that you don't know who is in your office, who's in your school, that like that LGBTQ folks, that trans folks and non-binary folks do exist. It's not if you think that you're somewhere and you're like, oh, I act we don't have any lesbian workers at our job. We don't have anyone, you know, non-binary job. They're just not safe to come out to you or to come out in this environment. Um, and so keeping that in mind, and even if it's like, I don't know, doing something as small as creating gender neutral bathrooms <laughs> or things like that um, in your space that signal that they're, um, that people exist, even if they're not out. I mean, I think employers have a huge role to play in making their workplaces safe spaces where people have the freedom to feel like they can come out because so much of how people react in the workplace is driven by the signals that get sent by their employers. Um, how about you, Eric? I mean, I'm sorry, Charlotte, how about you? Do you have anything you wanna to add to this? Yeah, just piggybacking off what Erica said, uh, according to HRC's workplace report from a couple of years ago, about half of non-LGBTQ workers uh, surveyed said that they didn't know of any LGBTQ people in their workplace. Half. <laughs> and so I think that there are a lot of non-LGBTQ people walking around believing that there are no LGBTQ people in their workplace, and that is completely false. Um, and it corresponds with another sad statistic in that over half of uh, LGBTQ people in the workplace are in the closet. They're not out to their coworkers, more than half in 2021. So, you know, this is a problem where people, even in states where they're ostensibly progressive and pro LGBTQ, they often don't feel comfortable coming out because of the backlash that they could receive. So just be mindful that with all the progress we've made, there's still a lot of fear and stigma out there against the LGBTQ people. Um, I want to thank all of you for your responses to these questions from our audience. Do we have any other audience questions that you want to type in the Q&A quickly, anyone? If not, um, I'm going to go in on to what are our calls to action, because really that's what this is all about. What are, our, what are we going to do about this? Um, because it's lovely to come to panel discussions but we all need to walk away um, with the ability to take some action. But I'm gonna actually, we have a question from the, from the audience and I'm gonna get to that. Um, they wanna know how do we support and encourage LGBT candidates to get into these positions of decision-making? And I'm gonna just talk for a minute about some of the issues those candidates need to work on. They need to work on passing the Equality Act we need to demand that LGBTQ people who are immigrants are being released from detention centers. We need to lobby the White House to set up a task force on violence against trans people. We need to end solitary confinement of LGBTQ people in prisons and detention centers. We need to end solitary confinement for everyone. We need to update laws as they relate to sex work. We need to end qualified immunity for police officers. That means that police officers don't get a pass when they commit civil rights violations and crimes, so-called in pursuit of their jobs. And we need to empower workers to organize. So panelists, how do we get LGBTQIA people to run for office to help implement some of those policies? Anybody? All right, Charlotte, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. Um, put your money where your mouth is. You know, give money to queer candidates, specifically 
uh, you know, black and brown queer people, specifically trans folks. There are a lot of trans people who want to run for office and who are trying to run for office right now, um, but they don't have the resources they need to get off the ground. Uh, I, you know, I watched as two trans women in New York uh, couldn't really continue their campaigns because they didn't have the money to do so, even, even with some of the support they got. Uh, you know, and this is, this is so preventable. There are so many highly qualified trans people who could do great in office, but they don't have the resources they need. So donate to Victory Fund. Uh, you know, donate to uh, Land Illegal, donate to the organizations that are fighting for this kind of equity. And, and more, more than that, donate to the local organizations that are really supporting trans people. I'm going to type in um, the link to the uh, Black Trans Travel Fund. And it's trying to work for uh, uh, access for Black trans women to have safer travel, uh, to get to their jobs, to get from point A to point B without being vulnerable to violence and discrimination. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. So, Rodrigo, how do we get LGBTQIA plus people to run for office? Well, if you are queer and watching this, run. You deserve to have your voice heard. If you've even thought about it for a second, run. Because at the end of the day, you are the change that our community needs. People like us are not in decision-making seats um, to the level that we should be, which in my opinion should sometimes be 100% of, of government. Um, but you, you should run. And I think, um, I see statistics all the time. I think it's um, uh, women are told, like have to be told like eight or seven times before they actually do run. And I would imagine if you're a queer person, particularly a queer woman, it's like 20 times because there's so many different factors that, you know, uh, push people to believe that they're not good enough, that their voice is not good enough, that, you know, X, Y, Z, you're not, you know, you know, if you are thinking about it, just do it. And there are people who are ready to support you. There are organizations ready to train you. Um, if I, I'm not a citizen, but if I live in your district and I was a citizen, I would vote for you. So if that's kind of the confidence that you need, just do it, you know, um, know that people believe in you and are ready to, to be on your, on your team. Um, and you are that change that we need because who better to advance LGBTQ rights than people within our community? Erica, do you have any quick thoughts on this? I think they they said it all, or Jigo and Charla said it all. Um, yeah, run, and we need to support people who are running um, financially. We need to support people who are running in community, um, making sure they have the resources, um, not just materially, but like also, like it's hard. You know, the like mental health resources are needed, <laughs> like make sure people are safe, all of those things. Um, but yeah, run, please. I would love to vote for a black queer woman and like here for it, <laughs> ready. All right. Well, lucky okay. for me, I live in Georgia and Park Cannon is my representative and someone that I do know who's a, a young black queer woman who is an incredible leader and also was arrested for trying to interrupt the vote, the, the ridiculousness in Georgia for the governor signing a terrible voting, um, well, whatever, you know, did, uh, uh, not a voting bill, a discrimination uh, bias bill. So I would like to thank all of our amazing panelists for taking the time to speak with us. We did it, we did it in an hour, y'all. It's, it's five where I am. We hope these conversations are generative and will, and will prepare, propel us to action. And please be on the lookout for more information about the upcoming event series, which um, the next one is Katrina, Maria, and Sandy. Climate justice is a feminist issue on April 22nd. Thank you so much for joining us and y'all have a great night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.